Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In today's lecture, we are going to look at the concept of heat capacity and how much energy that can be held through heat as things are warmed or cooled or heated by various methods. So let's go ahead and get started today. And what we're going to look at first, what is heat? Well, heat is the spontaneous transfer of energy due to a temperature difference, and it is measured in joules. And you'll recognize this as a form of energy. And we will look at that and see how this is uh, a form of energy coming up. But heat is just another form of energy and is measured in the same units in the SI units, although we often use it in calories. So calories is a definition of a calorie is the temperature needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now this is very different or somewhat different than the calorie that we talk about when we use talk about nutrition. There we are talking about kilocalories or thousand calories. So what we call a calorie with a capital C is actually a kilocalorie. And that's when we're talking about food energy. So the calorie in the scientific sense is a lot smaller, one one thousandth of the calorie that we're talking about in a nutritional sense. So you do have to keep track of that difference. If you're thinking about the number of calories in something, you can't compare that to the number of calories in something in food. There is a factor of one thousand difference between the two. Now, how do we know that these two are the same? How do we know that heat and energy are the same? And I tell you that here, but how did we find this out? Well, this was done by an experiment by James Prescott Joule uh, a, long, a while ago. And one of the experiments that he did was to be able to convert gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. And we've looked at that before, how you can convert potential energy, in this case, by the weights being suspended and allowing them to drop down. And that would then convert them into kinetic energy as they fall, they will move faster. And that will convert them into kinetic energy. And that will spin the we can spin the dial here. And that will then heat up the water with thermometer in the water. And that will then convert to heat. So this was the first experiment that was done to show that work or energy is the same thing as heat. And it is that energy is conserved. We do not lose any energy in this system. So remember when an object fell, if you hold a book up above a table, it has some potential energy. When you drop it, it gains kinetic energy until it smashes into the table and it stops. At that point, it no longer has either potential or kinetic energy. But it does have energy that has been given off as heat and sound. And that's where the energy has gone. Now, when we look at this, it was also determined, you know, what is the mechanical equivalent of heat? So how can we relate heat energy to the energy that we're used to in terms of kinetic or potential energy? And this is the work needed to produce the same effect as heat transfer. And one kilocalorie is 4186 joules. So we'll use that from time to time when we want to convert heat energy and compare that into an amount of work that is done. Now, when we look at phase changes, that is also a way to to use the energy. Uh, a phase change occurs when the matter changes state from a solid to a liquid, from a liquid to a gas, or sublimating from a solid directly to a gas. And this can do a couple of different things. And this happens when heat is added or removed from a system. In that case, the internal energy changes, which will either increase or decrease the temperature. And depending on the te exact temperatures and conditions may involve a phase change. Now, how will we know? Well, it depends on the exact conditions. We know, for example, that water will boil, turn from a liquid into a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. So if you have water at 
30 degrees Celsius and heated up to 60 degrees Celsius, you have just heated the water. It is still liquid water and no phase change occurs. However, if you take water at 80 degrees Celsius and heat it up to steam at 110 degrees Celsius, then a phase change had to occur at the 100 degree mark when it changed. And we'll take a look at some of that coming up. Okay, so uh, the other thing we want to look at is the heat capacity, which is the basic subject of this lecture. Uh, so if there are no phase changes, the heat transfer will depend on a couple of different things. It will depend on the change in temperature, the mass, and the substance and what phase it is in. So the equation that we use is Q, which is the amount of heat is equal to the mass times the specific heat of the substance C times the change in temperature. So Q is equal to M times C times delta T. So C is what we call the specific heat of a substance and is the amount of heat needed to raise one kilogram of the material by one degree Celsius. The units for this are generally joules per kilogram Kelvin or sometimes used depending on this problem kilocalories per kilogram degree Celsius. So it just depends on the specifics of the problem that would be the units for C depending on exactly what you are given in the problem. So so we can take a look at a couple of examples here in the diagram. If you take a certain amount of heat and apply it to a substance and you consider taking twice the amount of heat, it will raise the temperature by twice as much because you are not changing the mass in this case. However, if you have a certain amount of mass here and you have another that is twice the mass and you want to raise them by the same temperature, you now need twice the amount of heat. It also depends on the specific substance. So if we look at one substance here, copper, and we need some number of heat to raise it by a certain temperature, and we have the same mass of water and the same temperature change here, in order to get that same temperature change, in this case, we need 10.8 times the amount of heat. So the amount of heat needed to, ch to change the temperature of the copper is much less than the amount of heat needed to change the same amount of water by the same temperature change. So it depends on things like the amount of temperature change you want to get, the amount of energy put in, the mass of the object, and the composition of the object, what it is. Some objects are much more uh, easy, are much easier to heat than others. OK, so let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples here and work through a couple of examples for the rest of this lecture. And the first example says that we're taking a 0.5 kilogram aluminum pan. So there's our pan there and it is being used to heat 0.25 liters of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. And we want to know the amount of heat that is required. Well, let's go ahead and see what we know here. And here we put our numbers down, all of our values that we known, uh, noting that you might have to look up values for example, the specific heats of water and the specific heat of aluminum, because we're looking at those two. And you can use table 14.1 in the textbook for assistance when you're looking these up. So what we know is that the mass of water is equal to the volume times the density. Remember density equals mass divided by volume. If we rearrange that then the mass equals the volume times the density and we know those two things. We know the volume of the water and the density of water is exactly 1000 kilograms per cubic meter. So that tells us that 0.5 liters is 0.2 or probably 0.25 liters is 0.25 kilograms. And we can continue with our equation, which says that the heat of the heat needed is the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature. And we know what the change in temperature is because we know how far it changes. In fact, we have that here at 60 degrees Celsius. Remember in our problem, it went from 20 to 80 degrees Celsius. 
So we know those we know those numbers here. Let's go ahead and put them in and we get 0.25 kilograms, which we've calculated. We know the value of C for water 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And we know that the temperature change was 60 degrees. And that gives us a total of 62.8 kilojoules. Now, we're looking for the heat, then we're not done yet. That was for the water. That was what it took to heat up the water. How about the aluminum? Because they're going to have to be at the same temperature. So the aluminum, we use the same equation. And we put in our values for aluminum. In this case, it's 0.5 kilograms. We know that the uh, specific heat is 900 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. The temperature change is the same. And that gives us in this case 27 kilojoules. So the total, we just have to add those two together. So it's 62.8 kilojoules plus 27 kilojoules or 89.8 kilojoules is the amount of heat that was required to raise the temperature of the water and the pan from 20 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Now we can do one more example with this as well. And let's take a look at that. Uh, we're going to look at the what it caught what it takes for the great temperature increase. We're looking for the temperature increase this time of a 100 kilograms of brake material. So the material in the brakes of the truck going down a hill, if that has a specific heat given here of 800 joule per kilogram degree Celsius, and if it retains 10% of the energy from a 10,000 kilogram truck descending 75 meters at a constant speed. Now we know everything we need to be able to calculate this. So let's go ahead and look at it. Let's put down what we know. We know the mass of the truck that is given to you. We know the height that it is descending 75 meters. We know the mass of the brake material 100 kilograms. And we know the specific heat of the brake material is 800 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So that's everything we know. So our first thing is to get the energy. How much energy is involved? What is the potential energy of the truck that is changing? Well, potential energy, as you recall, is equal to m, the mass, times the gravitational constant, times the change in height, which was 75 meters. So we take those. We know the mass of the truck was 10,000. We know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. And we know that the change in height was 75 meters. So we know everything there and we can find the energy, which is 7.35 times 10 to the sixth joules. Now, of course, that's not exactly what we're looking for because the material doesn't retain all of that energy. It retains only 10% of it. So we can divide out a factor of 10 or remove one, one, one exponent. So go take the exponent goes from 6 to 5. And 10% of that potential energy, the energy actually retained by the brake material, is 7.35 times 10 to the fifth joules. So remember, go back to our heat equation. Now that we know the amount of energy involved, we can say that the Q is equal to MC delta T, or solving for temperature, which is what we're looking for, is equal to Q divided by M times C. Now we know all of those numbers because we know the amount of heat and equivalent amount of energy we need which is 7.35 times 10 to the fifth joules. The mass of the brake material is 100 kilograms. And the specific heat of the brake material was 800 joule per kilogram degree Celsius. So that means that the temperature change would be 9.2 degrees Celsius. So that is how much the brake material would heat up over this uh, descent of the truck going down to going down a going down a steep hill. And that's you think about that, that's them with them only retaining 10% of the heat. And you can imagine what the heat would be if their brakes were retaining all of that energy as the truck goes goes down, it would be far, far more. So these are just a couple of examples of what we can do with the heat capacity equation. And you can look at a couple more in other assignments that you will have for the class as well. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. 
And what we found, first of all, we talked about heat, which is the spontaneous transfer of energy due to a temperature difference. We defined the mechanical equivalence of heat, which relates energy in kilocalories to energy in joules. So it allows us to work with uh, energies that are calculated in joules. If we're converting from potential or kinetic energy, we can then use those to equate them to the amount of heat. And then finally, we worked a couple of examples using the heat capacity of a substance tells you how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So that concludes this lecture on heat capacity. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.